Earth is a ladder. For just 47 minutes, the shortest episode so far this season, the spoils of war managed to pack more action than the rest of Game of Thrones Season 7 combined. Let's get started, shall we? Bronn complains to Jaime for a well-deserved raise. He has been a mercenary for the Lannisters for free for the past few years. And Jaime echoes the sentiment of the late, great, notorious B.I.G. The more money you make, the more problems you get. Later in the episode, we watch Bronn spill his coins and choose to leave them behind rather than risk his life to get them back. One Redditor points out that in the very last shot, Jaime is literally being drowned by his heavy, golden Lannister armor. Is the idea of casting off wealth and privilege in exchange for life and freedom going to become a common theme for the men on Team Cersei? Speaking of money, as Cersei and Tycho Nestoris prattle on about sums and interests and arrears, the accountant from the Iron Bank takes the time to name drop the Golden Company. I know them well. Book readers will remember that the Golden Company is the group of sellswords founded by Aegor Rivers, the legitimized bastard of Aegon Targaryen IV. While most sellswords have a reputation for being unreliable, the Golden Company was said to have never broken a contract. That is, until they broke their contract with the Free City of Myrrh in A Feast for Crows, for a mysterious and unknown reason. There are 10,000 men in the company, along with thousands of horses and elephants. If Cersei winds up enlisting their help, they could be a serious match for the Unsullied or even the Dothraki on the field of battle. Not to mention that they're also run by the descendants of Aegon Targaryen. It's a long shot, but we could be in for another secret Targaryen reveal. When Littlefinger is trying to pry information out of Bran about what he's seen north of the Wall, Bran repeats Baelish's own words back to him. Chaos is a ladder. Does Bran know that it was Littlefinger that sent the assassin to kill him, starting the War of the Five Kings? Almost certainly. The only question is, will Bran snap out of his magic-induced funk long enough to rekindle some pride in his family and take revenge on the most despicable schemer in Westeros? As Jon and Daenerys enter the cave together, we hear some unfamiliar orchestral music that rises in beautiful major swells, different from the minor chords we're more used to. Could this be our first listen to Jon and Daenerys' theme song? Nothing in Game of Thrones is ever a coincidence. And the last time Jon Snow was in a cave with a lady, well, you know. Huh. Jon may never give up his title of King in the North, but if the Targaryen Snow marriage takes place, then he may not have to. With all this romantic foreshadowing in the cave, the only question now is not will they or won't they, but will Danny and Jon get it on before or after they figure out they're related? In Inside the Episode, Benioff and Wise comment on the similarity between the symbols on the inside of the cave and the geometric shapes we've seen the White Walkers create before. One of the things we learn from these cave paintings is that the White Walkers didn't come up with those images. They derived them from their creators, the children of the forest. We're not sure exactly what they signify, but spiral patterns are important in a lot of different cultures in our world and it makes sense that they would be in this world as well. Looks like Bran's not the only one that can quote people's own lines back to them. Daenerys asks Jon the exact same question he asked Mance Raider back in Season 5. Isn't, Isn't their survival more important, important than your pride? This doesn't mean she's omniscient, however. Just that she and Jon have nearly identical philosophies and ruling styles. Earlier this season, one creator wrote an article about the beautiful symbolism shown between Daenerys and Tyrion thanks to blocking and clever camera work. While most of his life, Tywin and Cersei have gone out of their way to physically look down on Tyrion, Daenerys has always afforded him a greater level of respect, which was reflected in the cinematography. But now, Tyrion has advised her straight into two massive military failures, and Daenerys scolds him like a child. If I have underestimated our enemies... Our enemies? Your family, you mean? She stops and towers over him, not quite shouting, but rage-talking directly in his surprised and sheepish face. The Aracy? The Ariacy? Whatever. The point is, in this latest Inside the Episode, Benioff and Wise revealed that Arya's long-awaited return to Winterfell was inspired by the end of the Odyssey, when Odysseus returns home after his long and arduous journey and no one recognizes him. I'm Arya Stark, this is my home. <laughs> it also plays into Arya's habit of disguising herself as someone else, which she's been using to protect herself for the past seven seasons. She's been someone else, or no one, so often, it must have taken a toll on her identity. If I'm not who I say I am, I won't last long. 
Stannis Baratheon may never have gotten to sit on the Iron Throne, but he'll always be the undisputed King of Grammar, as he made a hilarious habit out of constantly correcting Davos' speech. And it's four less fingernails to clean. Fewer. Pardon? Four fewer fingernails to clean. Now it looks like the once illiterate Davos has retained much of what he learned from his former king, as he corrected Jon Snow's grammar without missing a beat. How many men do we have in the north to fight him? 10,000 less? Fewer. What? There's always room for one more cameo in Game of Thrones. An honor typically reserved for musicians, Benioff and Wise managed to sneak Met's pitcher Noah Syndergaard into Daenerys' barbecue as a spear-hurtling Lannister soldier with a conveniently raised visor. The tension-building tactics at the beginning of the battle scene were reminiscent of movies like Zulu and The Lion King. But director Matt Shockman revealed that he took his inspiration from two specific battle sequences in cinema. Saving Private Ryan and Apocalypse Now. Did you notice the parallel? The final battle scene drew inspiration from the ancient battle known as the Field of Fire. This was the final battle in the Targaryen Conquest, after which Aegon the Conqueror became the undisputed King of Westeros. In the battle, the Lannisters and the Gardeners, the former lords of the Reach before House Tyrell, fought against Aegon and his sisters and their three massive dragons. House Gardener was completely wiped out, making way for House Tyrell to become the liege lords of the Reach. Loren Lannister survived only because he chose to bend the knee to Aegon. Like House Gardener before them, House Tyrell is gone. Will Jaime Lannister choose to save his people and bend the knee to the Mother of Dragons? Robert Baratheon predicted this disaster way back in Season 1 when he explained to Cersei that the Westerosi armies would be no match for the Dothraki. The Targaryen girl convinces her horse lord husband to invade, and the Dothraki horde crosses the narrow sea. We won't be able to stop them. Let's say Viserys Targaryen lands with 40,000 Dothraki screamers at his back. We hole up in our castles. Wise move. Only a fool would meet the Dothraki in an open field. Since this part of his speech has already come to pass, the next part seems almost guaranteed to be foreshadowing of the impending rebellion against Cersei. They leave us in our castles. They go from town to town, looting and burning, killing every man who can't hide behind a stone wall, stealing all our crops and livestock, enslaving all our women and children. How long do the people of the Seven Kingdoms stand behind their absentee king? Their cowardly king hiding behind high walls? When did the people decide that Viserys Targaryen is the rightful monarch after all? 